welcome to Hot Issues. Uh, today we are taking a look at Sierra Leone. Once described by some persons as the cradle of peace in Africa, and yet it managed to explode into a civil war with dark consequences for its people and the entire Africa. Now it's been caught up in the Ebola outbreak. But in spite of these two stories, we are also told that Sierra Leone has some very interesting and good stories to tell. Welcome to Hot Issues. Welcome to Hot Issues. And today we are taking a look at Sierra Leone. We are taking a look at Sierra Leone in all its dimensions. We're going to look at its geographical location, what it portends for the people, and so on. Look at the size of its population. We look at its per capita income. We look at everything about Sierra Leone. How such a peaceful people could explode into violence. And how they're dealing with the Ebola outbreak and issues of governance. And we are particularly privileged to have with us in the studio the foreign minister of this West African Republic called Sierra Leone and his doctor Samuru Kamara. Doc, you're welcome to the studio. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, sir. First, what brings you to Accra? <sighs> um, as you may be aware, the presidency of the African Development Bank becomes vacant uh, in May this year and uh, there will be elections for a new president. And so my president, Dr. Anders Baikroma, has uh, sent uh, a letter to his uh, colleague and brother, President Mahama, seeking his support and support of the government and uh, people of Ghana for Sierra Leone's candidacy for this vital position. Who is Sierra Leone's candidate, by the way? Surprisingly, it's me sitting in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you want to abandon the position of foreign minister for president of the African Development Bank? I know. A foreign minister has enormous influence and can contribute a lot to the development of his country. I think it's, it's to, uh, as a way of um, bringing forward Sierra Leone's uh, incremental contribution to African development as well. Sierra Leone has had a tremendous experience in, 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 in uh, as you rightly mentioned in your preamble, in transforming a country from a post-conflict country to a country that is now one of the fastest, uh, it has one of the fastest growing economies, uh, that is renowned, that is well respected for the speed of uh, post-conflict reconstruction. And, and, and we believe we have quite a lot of lessons to, to, to to extend to, to our brothers, but more particularly to the running of uh, such an important institution for Africa. And broadly speaking, what is the mandate of the African Development Bank, broadly? Broadly, it's about pursuing Africa's uh, destiny and future the best way possible. Which we have to look at all aspects of development, economic, social, cultural, you name it, uh, seeking the welfare of the people not on a very short-term basis, but it has to be a continual process until the day when Africa becomes very, very prosperous and self-reliant. Why are African countries still running to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and so on when we have our own institutions? What is in inadequate about our institutions? You're quite correct. There are so many reasons for that. Um, institutional strengthening is, is very important. I do not think some of our institutions have what it bears, really, to, to be able to adequately address the challenges facing Africa. Uh, and therefore, the number of multitude of uh, institutions we have probably need a proper consolidation of their effort. Don't forget, we have the African Development Bank, we have Exim Bank, we have, uh, we have uh, at the political level, you have the AU, you have ECOWAS, you have SADEC, there's so many institutions. Perhaps what, what is now required, a uh, consolidation of, of, of their efforts, like NEPAD, for instance, bring them all together. But um, I think 
it's an aggregation of some of the frailties that are inherent in the member countries as well. Now, Your Excellency, what kind of competition are you expecting? For, for this position? Well, naturally, every country, as a member of, of, of the African Development would want to, uh, to, to hold the presidency of the African Development Bank. So, on a broad line basis, there are about 53 countries in Africa. So, one should expect every member country to, to, to have a candidate. But uh, as of today, we haven't done the nomination yet, so it's difficult to have any candidate that has had uh, been validated by a committee which has been set up to do the process of validation. But the numbers, the names that are going, that are going around, you have something like between six and seven candidates. What would you personally bring to the job? There are one or three, one or three, one or three elements. The first one, I'll be riding on the back of Sierra Leone's successes as, as a post-conflict country that has done very well and it's now, um, a, it's now a, a, a pilot project, a pilot country in terms of how to move from emergency humanitarian to, to, to sustainable development, to high growth and all the rest of it. Two, I've been part of it from the beginning to now. So I've been pivotal, I've been central in high-level decision-making, in designing programs, in uh, implementing those programs, in moving forward. And three, I think uh, my background within international circles, I think I have enough in experience. I have enough experience of the activities, the management and administration of the key international institutions, including the African Development Bank. So I think uh, I have a lot of uh, 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 knowledge to draw from. And then, of course, you also know the challenges of Africa. We see in them. The circumstances are changing, and therefore it requires a new thinking in some of these, some of these ways. So where is the knowledge and experience coming from? Certainly not from the position of foreign minister. No. Uh, I have moved a bit in, 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 in Sierra Leone and in international circles. Um, I finished my, my undergraduate degree in 1972, and I joined the Central Bank, and I rose up to the level of uh, the position of Deputy Director of Research. So I've been doing a lot of research work, both at national and for in, at international level. And then I left the Central Bank and joined the Commonwealth Secretariat, started off as a, a senior economics officer in 1991 to 1994. And then I came back in 1997 when the war broke out in Sierra Leone. And then I rose to the level of uh, chief economics officer at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And then I, in Sierra Leone, in 1994, I was called to, to manage the Minister of Finance. The very first time that... Uh, Somebody who's not a civil servant has been called to, to manage the Minister of Finance. But as I come. As minister or. No, as no, as uh, a financial secretary, like a permanent secretary. Okay. So in 1994. So I came there, but I was also managing the World Bank uh, Structural Adjustment Program. I was a manager. So I combined the two offices. Because at that time it was necessary. Whilst we were pursuing the war, it was important that we did not lose the country. We did not lose the lives of the people as well. So we needed uh, structural adjustment programs that will help us soften the, the impact of, of the world. So I managed that 1994 until uh, 1997 when actually the, the war escalated and so we all ran. And that's when I came back to the Common Secretariat as a, as a, second, a second leg. And then in 2001, I was in the Commonwealth Secretariat as Chief Economics Officer when I was recalled by the Chijan Kaba government to come back again and run the Minister of Finance, again as, as, as Financial Secretary, just to pursue the programs and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I was in that position until 2006. Then I left and went to the IMF and uh, joined there as Alternative Executive Director representing 22 African countries at Constituency Group 1. Mm -hmm. And I was there. Uh, on the board with staff working. 2007, the present president, Anis Bekrumah, won the elections. And then he summoned me to come back. 
So I came back. I readily I came back. I did not wait to finish my time at the IMF, you know. So I just had to come because I thought I w I needed to do more for Sierra Leone than even for, for the IMF when I was there. Now, when I came, unfortunately, I was not a registered voter. So I could not become the, 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 the intended position, which was Minister of Finance and Economic Development. So I was posted to the central bank as governor which was my, my, my base and all the rest of it. So I was there in 19, 1998, 2008 and 2009, March. And then the president, finally, when I registered, I came to the Minister of Finance, as a Minister of Finance. And I was there until 2012. And during that process, we, I pi pioneered two important uh, uh, programs, poverty and growth programs, um, Agenda for Change and Agenda for Prosperity. And then the president thought it fit in 2007 to send me to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And here I've been there, and I thought this was a very appropriate challenge for me because I thought in all countries the foreign service needs to be strong. It needs to work very hard because it is the eye it is the eye of, 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 of any country. A lot of international cooperation normally is channeled through to the foreign ministry. So I've been there since 2000 and, uh, since November 2000, actually December 2012. Now I'm a little bit over one year, and I've just completed uh, the first ever uh, uh, transformation strategy for the entire foreign service of Sierra Leone. Because there is no way you can position uh, a foreign ministry within the context of modern diplomacy and international cooperation without having a, a, a road map. So I've just completed and just presented a copy to the president before coming to Accra on this mission. Mm. What is your own evaluation of the structural adjustment programs? Well, it has been mixed results. There have been mixed results. Uh, positive, negative. Uh, while in Sierra Leone, at one stage I was involved in writing the, the, the UNDP study on the structural adjustment with touching human face. I remember I was uh, one of the consultants that went up to Kenya trying to prepare uh, background papers. Um, structural adjustment theories may be the same, but in practice, the focus has changed a little bit. Uh, those days, it was all about economic restraint. Uh, macroeconomic stability was, was defined by having low inflation, low deficit, weak, uh, low money supply, this sort of thing. Um, well, perhaps at that time, it may have succeeded a bit because I don't think many African countries had big ambitions. Ambitions that they have now. The development surge that is taking place now was not there in the 80s. And it started at the beginning of the 90s, late the end of the 90s, and now more so the beginning of the, of, of the new millennium. Today we're talking about uh, uh, the need for rapid infrastructure development, which requires a huge amount of capital outlay. The need for incremental capital going through the value chain. The need for incremental spending on education, on health, like what Ebola has taught us now. Uh, we do not have a strong public health system. So the demands, the requirements, the ambitions of, of African countries have changed, and therefore structural adjustment programs need to change now. And I'm happy that uh, the dimension is changing a little bit. Countries are now being allowed some, some expansionary uh, spending you know, and in managing, in managing their budgets, so to be able to finance these uh, highly uh, expenditure-driven, high expenditure-driven uh, projects. I've read some comments about uh, Sir Leon, which say that the austerity imposed by IMF and World Bank was largely responsible for the inability to contain the Ebola outbreak. <laughs> well. I would not say so because the Salon economy is not a big economy at the time I was in finance. You were talking about a total budget of a little over $300 million, which an ordinary footballer, I'm sure one of your footballers there, can, can just boost off. Um, now, when you have that type of budget, 
fifty percent of which is salaries, wages and salaries to the public sector. And then you have a sizable amount for, for on health. You have a good amount for defense and security. So there was very little amount left for the development dimension of, of, of the budget. I can tell you one example. At one stage, I thought we did not have more than $30 million just for economic development projects. To build one road alone, one kilometer of a road, costs you nearly $1 million. To have one kilowatt of electricity costs you nearly $1 million. So if you have $30 million on a development budget, how much can you do? So with or without IMF programs, I think the economy was small. We did not perhaps put a lot of emphasis in resource mobilization, internal resource mobilization. But luckily for us, all of that is changing. We are now exploiting our resources much better. So, but Sierra Leone is, is one of the richest countries in the world. It has enormous resources. You're right. Potentially, yes. How come your budget is so small? How yes, come potentially. That you have to you may you have, have diamonds, you have yes. name them. You have the resources on the ground. Resources are, are not are not income. They do not earn. They do not improve living standard until they are exploited. Now, let me just explain a little bit about diamonds. Yes, we have diamonds, but the government did not mine diamonds. Those companies that mine diamonds were mainly external companies, and then we had also support. We had uh, policy advice from external external advisors. That bordered on the, the 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 need to stabilize income from 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 the diamond sector for government. You would not you'd be surprised if I were to tell you that um, out of every diamond exported, government only gets three percent of the. Is income. that not the problem? That's one big problem. Is 3%. that not the problem? It the is. It was, it was a problem, but again, that three percent came from. The, 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 the ambition from international institutions that were supporting us that you needed to standardize across the region, that the percentage we are charging uh, for Sierra Leone should not be higher than what Guinea was charging, what Niger uh, uh, Ghana, I mean, um, Liberia was charging because of the cross border pricing differentials and this sort So of they were thing. actually advocating a race to the bottom? Yes. Well, in practice, yes, that was what it, that what it meant, because we do not have old and uh, ownership of the resources, and that's one big problem. When countries do not have ownership of, of the exploitation of their resources, you can own the resources, but you must have a stronghold on the exploitation. Shouldn't all of Africa mm -hmm. be moving in the direction of taking control of our resources and exploiting those resources? Primarily for the benefit of our people. I do. I do, cannot agree more. That's that's the that's the vacuum that we that, that we need to correct. Resource management is very important in Africa, and I think we now have indicators that are helping us, like the EITI uh, is, is all helping us. And I also believe a lot of African countries have learned their lessons. Now they're looking at uh, they are better at contracting at negotiating. With, with, with potential uh, exploiters of natural resources. How would your presidency of the African Development Bank focus attention on this perspective of Africans owning their resources, exploiting them for themselves, and working for themselves? And African being responsible for, the, for their destiny and future. I quite agree. That's, for me, that is the trust. Is there an African way of doing it? I don't know, but that needs to be exploited. Uh, in China, they always talk about uh, the Chinese way, the Chinese way of doing things. Socialism, they call it socialist, democratic, dictatorship. That is the philosophy. Now, Africa must try to stand on its own. Yes, external development partners can come in only to consolidate, only to complement African efforts. But I think this is where the effort needs to come from. Where Africa will try and design I don't know how I could say an African theory an African policy dimension African activities an African way of doing things. I would have thought that that already has emerged from Samira Mill and uh, Adebaji uh, Adedeji. And Adedeji. So. Yes. Well those were days when I remember 
when the structural adjustment programs came, I know the UNEC, when Adedeji was there, they were looking for an alternate structural adjustment program for Africa. But it never, it never was concluded. They drew it up? Well, it was, it was there, but implemented, it was it never implemented. Yeah. It was not there. Those of us, some of us who read it, well, you cannot criticize, but you have to see the Africanness in, in a structural adjustment program. As you can see, there's a, I've been to China a little bit. You will see the way China is pushing its development. You know, you have a lot of uh, China using appropriate technology, you know, for its own good. I think Africa, we have a lot of resources. We have to re exploit the resources, but we have to add value. We have to use our resources to add value. But we exploit and send them overseas where value is added and then we buy them at more than triple prices. These are the challenges that we need to do, especially when it comes to resource management. But of course there are other dimensions also in order to push the, 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 the Africanness in terms of in terms of development. Um, take for instance uh, food and agriculture and food security. Today in Africa the majority of our people are in the rural areas, but they are the poorest. The land is there, the crops are there. Why haven't we focused on rural development, community development? Now, we have minerals as well. Education. Sierra Leone used to be the Athens of, of, of Africa in education. Today, quality has, has, has dropped, although it is picking up a little bit. We're trying to pick up. But again, because of the war, it, it, has, it has, has dropped considerably, so we need to pick it up again. Health, we've just been challenged by, 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 by Ebola. Attitude, to tell you the truth. I think that's one big problem, attitudinal change, behavioral pattern of Africans. In Africa, I think we do believe that everything must be done by by government for everybody. So just like that people will just sit and wait. I've seen people who build houses without access roads. They will wait for government to come and do the access roads for them. Yes, okay, if government have the resources, it is better for, gov for them to wait until government does the layout of ut all utilities. Then you come and plant your house. A typical example is what was done in Yamasukro by the late uh, Hufi Boni. Now, these are the examples that we have in Africa that we need to, 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 to develop. In Benin, I watched an integrated agricultural project with my president. I think we need to replicate that. These are landmarks because in one project you can do everything and the community survives. So we need to visit these projects and bring them and cultivate them for the rest of uh, uh, the African countries. Hmm. Hello and welcome back to Hot Issues. And we are in conversation with Dr. Samura Kamara, the Foreign Minister of Sierra Leone, who is pursuing the ambition of becoming President of the African Development Bank. How come that the peaceful people of Sierra Leone were thrown into this devastating civil war. What were the factors? Well, I was not there when the war broke out. I had left Sierra Leone. But when I came back in the Ministry of Finance uh, in 1994, the very first assignment was, my challenge was, to try to find uh, explanations for the causes of the war, economic explanations. And what came out was, quite evident that we have a lot of uh, economic marginalization, that we were too over-centralized. Everything was uh, with the central government. Uh, rural incomes were very, very low. Uh, a lot of communities were marginalized. Development was not spread, was not spread across, uh, across uh, the countries. Local government has, had collapsed at the time. Now, these thoughts plus what the Truth and Reconciliation Committee the TRC that was set up by government came up. These two combined to give us the true causes of, of, of the war, basically marginalization 
and, and you will say yes there were inappropriate policies but of course at that material time it was difficult because it was circumstantial for for uh, exchange rate for instance to be to, to be devalued because when you devalue the exchange rate you're trying to cut down the the level of imports and raise the level of uh, of export that gives an incentive to to exporters and an incentive to importers but be it uh, as it may we thought that we needed to spread economic dividend across the country. And that was one main cause of the war. Youth unemployment. Because once you are unemployed as a youth, you are a recipe, you are a reservoir for, for exploitation in the wrong way and this sort of thing. Um, gender. Women were, were, were disempowered. You know, so I didn't want to go too much into the political aspect, but from an economic perspective. And that's how we tried to develop programs we thought that was spreading, spreading development. And one of the landmark programs was, was decentralization. We reintroduced local government after 30 years and then had a fiscal and functional uh, de uh, uh, decentralization in government. I think that has helped a lot to spread development and across. Today, you will see Sierra Leone, the entire Sierra Leone is a works yard in terms of infrastructure development. It is not only in Freetown. All over, all the, the, the chiefdom, headquarter towns, all the, the feeder roads, uh, trunk roads, they are all under construction. And this time around, we did not wait for donor funding. When I was in finance, I managed to use the, the government budget. Of course, I had to deprive uh, uh, other departments from what I call non-essential expenditure this sort of thing. But this is exactly what, what we thought were the causes of the war. High unemp youth unemployment were disgruntled because we did not spread out development. Mm. What was the impact of this, of this war on Sierra Leone? And what perhaps were its consequences for the rest of West Africa and Africa? Well, we lost a lot of lives, as you may, as you may know. We lost um, both lives of Sierra Leoneans lives of those who went to help us fight the war, like Ekumog went from Nigeria and this sort of thing. Um, there was lots of destruction, physical destruction of roads, bridges, of buildings, we were burning buildings. And then, of course, a lot of miming. People, 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 people hands were, legs and limbs were caught and all the rest of it. I think it was not a very happy, happy scenery, really, the way the, way the war was, was, was being pursued. You know, because the war was pursued by people who were illiterate, they had no logic, they, they had no, I don't know what, what I call it, sensible ambition. Because you cannot be killing everybody and you want power. Who will you rule? Mm. This sort of thing. So it, it was like a, uh, uh, building a house on the sand, you know, and that because of illiteracy. Those who are pursuing the war were largely illiterate. Those who are illiterate that joined them, they joined them for selfish reasons. Because don't forget, this type of situation always creates opportunities for rent seeking, mm -hmm. for opportunism and this sort of thing. Even the present Ebola we have, you know, people always look for this type of equation, situation so, so to steal, to do lots of uh, uh, havoc to the country. But um, thank God. The conflict is behind us now. We signed the peace agreement in 2002, and uh, since then we have been moving rapidly. We do hope there will be no other conflict. That's why it, it hurts me when you hear conflict in other African countries. How, how far have you come? Land, right? How far have you come from the devastation of the conflict? Oh, it's, it's terrible. I mean, GDP was as down as minus in the 30s, you know. There was no economic activity, no social activity, no delivery of social services, you know. And today, we can boast of that. We can boast of comfortable, uh, reasonable level of GDP growth. GDP capital has more than doubled uh, since the war ended in 2002. Doubled from minus 37 to... Oh, GDP per capita, to at the time it was below one three hundred dollars. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, today we can boast of a very high GDP per capita. But of course, uh, the cost of living has also has also gone up uh, because of successive inflationary tendencies uh, and uh, and then price escalations. People using uh, scarcity pricing and all the rest of it, uh, commodity commodity scarcity. But schools are now rebuilding. We have enrollments has more than tripled. Uh, we have healthcare institutions 
But of course, now we know that they are not adequate. So we need to, 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 to build them up and move forward. When you say that healthcare is not adequate, what exactly are we talking about? Infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, hospitals, uh, health centers, doctors, nurses, the entire paraphernalia of the health infrastructure. Mm. Sierra Leone has, I don't think we have, our, our, our doctor per capita is, runs into the thousands. When in other countries, it's just a matter of tens of hundreds and this sort of thing, you know. Um, 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 that is not good for any country. One doctor can also have 1,000, 3,000, 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. That spread. Hospitals. We never had referral, uh, uh, good referral hospitals, this sort of thing. And then, of course, I said, we've been challenged by a virus which comes in as malaria, as typhoid, as uh, measles, etc. Mm -hmm. You need to, to you need emergency response uh, 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 capacity in holding centers. Once I detect, even without it, if I detect that you have slept in the same building with somebody who has been tested positive, we needed to to, to, to isolate you automatically, in, immediately, so that uh, you do not spread it further. If you have the symptoms, the symptoms will be cured, and you will not catch, uh, catch, catch the disease. But luckily, with Ebola, we are now laying the foundations. We have infrastructure foundations. So these are some of the, the, the inadequacies that we still have. In. We need a lot more doctors. Hmm. We need to train nurses. You know. When the Sierra Leone wake up, to the reality that Ebola had come. When and how? <laughs> when and how? Ebola started in, in May. Uh, at the beginning, everybody thought, well, not those within the area where it struck, there was a sense of denial that this was not Ebola, that this was a government uh, gimmick. Government came to, to unfortunately, it started in the area where the political party, the government party, doesn't have a majority. It's the opposition strength. And so when Ebola struck, they use it as a political weapon. Our government has come in, they brought it just to kill us so that they will, they will reduce our voting power in this area. That's the beginning. Others, out of sheer ignorance, they were just ignorant. They treated Ebola as an ordinary malaria, malaria disease until when it became full blown, there was no turning back, you know, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So there was this denial. Then, of course, we have cultural practices. Ebola becomes extremely contagious only when a person is dead or when it is full blown. At that material time, if you touch it, you will get it automatically. If you touch that person. So can you imagine when people say, okay, we have to wash bodies. Dead bodies. Yeah, dead bodies. And that's our tradition, especially in, in our religion, some religion. You have to wash dead bodies and prepare the bodies, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that it will go clean. I, have, I heard of one story where I was told that uh, the belief was that if somebody dies, immediately the angels will come down. Now, if they find that person uh, has not been washed properly, automatically that person will go to hell. The angels will just condemn that person to hell. But if they find you washed, then they will sit with you and talk to you. To washed judge you. Yeah, to, exactly. To, to judge you. And then you, who washed the body, you have a reward in heaven for washing. So, you know, this they may sound simple, but these are hardcore traditional beliefs, religious beliefs, which we have been struggling to let the people know. This one know. sounds more like imported religious belief. No, it's a typical African belief. I don't heaven, know whether here you don't do it. You don't wash heaven, dead bodies. Heaven yeah. is a Christian concept. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian myself, so I cannot speak for the Muslim. <laughs> for the Muslim. Heaven is a Christian but concept, isn't it? Christianity, yes. We we'll talk about Christianity out of Christ, this mm. sort of thing. But uh, in, in Muslim religion, we talk about uh, Arijana, we talk about heaven as well in, 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 the, in, the, in the Quran. It's, it's still imported. Well, I don't know how they got it, but it's in the Quran. Yeah, but Which I mean, one came first, the Bible or the Quran? 
The Bible. The Bible. The Bible. But what I mean first. is that whether it's Islam uh, or it's Christianity, uh, it's not African traditional religion. Well, so we either have, way, it's important. It has grown in Sierra Leone as a, a Sierra Leone tradition, perhaps. Let me not call it Africa. <laughs> <laughs> a Sierra Leone tradition. We today we find out uh, it's a major cause of the spread of Ebola. But luckily, people are now understanding it. There was an instance where one old village, they said Ebola was caused by uh, a plane that came. This plane had an accident and it is just crashed in the village. It was this plane crashed that brought the Ebola in the, in the village. These are all ways of disbelief. But luckily but there for have now, also been some suggestions that, that Ebola is an experiment gone bad. Well, there is no scientific, there is no scientific, scientific explanation. We don't know. Is it possible that the I United States know. of America no, no, I had know. some laboratory experiments around the, the areas of outbreak? No, no, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Because unless we see scientific explanation, it is very difficult to hold on to that view. No, but that's the fact that they had a laboratory experiment in, in those areas. Well, that's what I'm saying. Whether it is a biological weapon or not, it's difficult to tell. Remember in Iraq, uh, they spend a lot of time trying to look at to look for biological weapons. We never succeeded, you know, this mm -hmm. sort of thing. I think for us, the challenge now is to get Ebola out of Sierra Leone, out of Guinea, out of Liberia, and out of Africa. Because Ebola cannot be controlled when it strikes. How do we get Ebola out of, out of Sierra Leone, what we are doing now is, and What we are Mali? doing now is what we are doing. First of all, there are a number of statistics, four important statistics so far. First, the spread, the rate of spread of new cases. We calculate this on a daily basis, and it has gone down from over 100 today. We're talking about the 20, about 20, below 20. And that's a very good sign that Ebola is. Once you contain the spread, then you are, you are, you are eradicating uh, Ebola. The other one is the death rate. Today, as of today, I think we have something like... Uh, Two point, I think about two point eight. We have two point seven deaths, nearly two point eight thousand, thousand deaths, and then we have about seven point eight uh, thousand cases confirmed Ebola cases. But on top of that, we've had a little over two thousand survival and discharged using a, a symptomatic uh, therapy. So the way you 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 contain it is. Your surveillance and your contact tracing, tracing has to be excellent. Because if, for instance, there is a reported case of Ebola today, somebody has a high fever, and this person is taken, there is a 117 call, the ambulance will come, collect this person, and then this person is taken to a treatment center, a laboratory, and as soon as it is tested for, he or she is tested for Ebola, straight away, you quarantine that house. You isolate them. And as you isolate them in the house, or you isolate them in what we call a holding center, so that you take them out of the community, mm. so that you reduce this, the incidence of, 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 of spreading Ebola. Mm. That's one way. The other way is to have very quick tests. When we started, we did not have enough laboratories. Today we have quite a sizable number of laboratories and therefore we're able to do very quick tests within hours now or within minutes in some cases. Those days will take you weeks before a test result comes. And by the time the test result comes, you know what would have happened? Ebola would have incubated into your system and you would have spread it to your wife if you are a man to a husband, if you are a woman, to your children, to your neighborhood, well, whoever you touch, you know. And then the other area is safe burials. Government has not taken responsibility of doing all burials, whether it is Ebola or not Ebola. It is the government. You have a professional, professional teams, and they are spread all over the country. Today, every, we have 149 chiefdoms. Every chiefdom has a holding center. Mm. Every district has a treatment center. It has a, a, a laboratory. Most of them now, they have laboratories around. So there is a very strong international response also that has emerged. So we'll see how it goes. And of course, hygiene and sanitation. I think the bottom line is hygiene and sanitation. People had a sense of denial mm. not to, to keep 
good quality hygienic places. When perhaps when I was going to school, we used to have nature study, which you have hygiene. You go in the morning, you line up, you wash your fingers, you wash your what you wear, your shirt. We lost all of this, and I think we need to bring this back. Welcome back to Hot Issues, and we are in conversation with Dr. Samura Kamara, Foreign Minister of Sierra Leone. So there are reports that uh, you're not doing that well in the fight against Ebola as compared to Liberia and Guinea. Well, is I'm, that true, first of all? No, it's not. Contrary to that, perhaps let me make one clarification here. Sierra Leone was caught up in Ebola six weeks after Ebola was first spreading in Guinea and Liberia. So, like, we are the late comers in Ebola. And therefore, the state where we are now is the state where Guinea and Liberia were. Yeah? Uh, so you have that, that lag, that six weeks gap, you know, this sort of thing. But as I mentioned, when Ebola started and was growing, it had to peak. The numbers rarely were rising. We're talking about huge numbers per day, nearly 100 per day, and that was very disturbing. Today, because of the response mechanisms, the intensity, uh, deepening response, the search programs that we're having, we've closed down the country at one stage for three days. We districts are being closed where there are hotspots. As I speak here in Tongolili district, where is the hotspot? It's now closed. Uh, to be closed now for about six weeks. There is a surge in the western area that has uh, been extended beyond 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 four weeks. The numbers have gone down. Today we're talking about. Yesterday it was nineteen. I'm watching to this figure. By the end of the day, I will have the figure. I only hope. But the numbers are much below now. They are relatively, they are relatively good. But you cannot be complacent. Because as I said, if it happens, as I explained, any burial of an Ebola person takes place in the normal, traditional environment and modalities, mm -hmm. That's Most another cause for, for, for the spread. But we hope that people have not learned that lesson. The president is, is, is now deeply involved in, in social mobilization, because that's very important, like these practices we're mm -hmm. talking about. He's going around the country. He has done it several times. But he says this is his surge now. He's going to do it to tell the people, look, you have to be comfortable. With the numbers are coming down, but we need to work a bit more harder. The President of Ghana, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, yeah. appears to have earned a lot of commendation yes. in the fight against Ebola. Yes. What is your own view? It is true. As, uh, does he deserve it or are we over He does, he it? does. As chairman of, of, of ECOWAS and as president, he has performed his responsibilities in, in showing solidarity to those countries that are affected by Ebola. He has visited the three countries. In Sierra Leone, he was there. He was met by the president, and I was there. I had a big meeting. As a president of Ghana, he even took presents of rice, of oil, of cocoa. You know, he took a lot. Just to show that uh, Sierra Leone is not alone in the fight against Ebola. What he did for Ghana, I mean for Sierra Leone, he did for Liberia. He did for, 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 for Guinea. And on top of that, he has held several Ebola-related summits. And that's what you require. Because it's in that summit that you develop ECOWAS solidarity. You consolidate the ECOWAS effort. You get ideas, exchange knowledge, exchange ideas on how to move forward in the fight against Ebola. And above all, he has ho he's hosting on mayor, United Nations emergency, Ebola emergency relief thing. It's, 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 it's a big challenge. It takes a man to say, okay, fine, on mayor, come here, when other countries are stigmatizing. And Ghana has not stigmatized any Ebola person. Mm. It comes from the, his leadership, the messages he's telling his people that uh, there are preventive measures. There are cautionary measures that the countries are taking. That uh, you can stigmatize, uh, you can isolate Ebola, but not the country and its people. And I think he must be commended for that bravery. Beyond President Mahama, it's also what has been described as the, the, the 
extraordinary support of Cuba. Yes, Cuba, we have well over 160 do uh, doctors there. I think that's very good. Yes, it is. I mean, international support has been extraordinary in many respects. China, for instance, was the first to respond. China has also done, as I said, last week before I came, China continuously has had four, four sets, four badges of, of seven, four planes bringing in uh, uh, goods to support Ebola, medical personnel. China is now building um, what we call a permanent uh, uh, center for disease control and prevention. They have a mobile. The UK, there is one. The Italians are there. South Africa has provided one. Hmm. So we've got a lot of international support. That's why we think we are making a breakthrough in the fight against Ebola. The British have taken care of the western area. They have a whole emergency uh, uh, incident center at the British Council that monitors the movement as everything is, is happening. So um, we cannot complain now. The battle now is ours. Our attitude, our behavioral patterns, this practice we are talking about. And we can win the battle. Yes, we have to remain optimistic. Now that the numbers are coming, I think we are making some headway. Now, I'd like you to abandon your, your cap as a foreign minister and try donning on another cap as a prophet. How do you see West Africa going into the near future, given the fact that we've signed the economic partnership agreement with Europe? How is this going to play out in West Africa? Well, I think it is... These partnership agreements are good. It depends if you have the capacity to exploit them to your advantage. It's not only this economic partnership with the EU. We also signed uh, some other partnership with the US, AGOA, for instance. You cannot exploit this if. No, we couldn't fully. exploit our Yes, our if you do not put emphasis on the proper management of your resources. But are these partnerships yes. really the most important things or the, well, the, the drive of our government to take hold of our resources? Yes, it is, but you cannot, the world is not an isolated, you cannot isolate yourself. Whatever you may say, the European markets, European countries are strategic countries. They're good for Africa, they're good for West Africa. So therefore, exploit them to your advantage. In foreign policy, we always say you, 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 you follow diplomacy you do for peace and security in the world while seeking your own national interests. These two must come hand in hand. So therefore, when you sign an agreement, I sign an agreement with you, there has to be a win-win, a win-win result. Most of the agreements you've signed are lose-lose, you know. Well, perhaps I mean, lose -lose result. it is possible that we have weak institutions to exploit them. If you have weak institutions, you have weak human resources, weak capacity, then you are signing an agreement from a very, very weak position. So it's time to be exploited. But as I said earlier, I think the EPA has taken a number of years in the drawing board. I think where we are now is why I think a lot of countries are not strong enough to stand up to the Europeans to say, look, this is what we want, and that's what is being negotiated in the EPA. Well, Your Excellency Dr. Samora Kamara, mm. thanks very much for coming to the studio. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, viewers, uh, talking to for you. listening. Thank you. Well, listeners, this is the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Sierra Leone, which has gone through many problems and so on, and is beginning to rise again. I hope all of us have learned enough from this conversation. Uh, it's goodbye from us. But don't forget to keep your dial on TV3.